in it. So, okay. all right, fantastic. Uh, for anybody that's showing up and trying to figure out where we're at, uh, the old guy of the group hit start broadcast and then the end broadcast back to back. So you got to be careful you're not playing online plo- poker and getting used to the double click to bet, 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 bet. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> I'm gonna. Get, Go and fix everything else while everybody else is inter- uh, introducing themselves. My name is Scott Levengood. I'm the founder of a, a couple of groups on Facebook. One of them is Social Media Marketing Help. And uh, today we've got several guests that are going to be talking about building relationships through social networking. Um, and a couple of them I met yesterday on Facebook. Others I met today on Google Hangout. And I've seen them on Facebook before. So uh, we're going to talk about how you can truly start building relationships even if you don't know people in person or anything else, whether you're old like me or young like these guys. Guys, it works for everybody. Uh, you just got to pick your platform and go. So again, we're going to start with uh, Dan. We'll go Dan, Jake, Michael, and uh, Omid. I hope I get that name right. Uh, while you guys introducing yourself, I will go ahead and uh, blue box you so that you're the center. So Dan, you are now on. And when you get done, I'll go to Jake, and then I'll go fix all the other things that I've got wrong. Cool. <laughs> sure. Uh, my name is Dan Deganji. I'm out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I am a actually a web developer or programmer by day, um, and then entrepreneur by night. At least that's what I like to say. Um, I've I've been a, a social media nut for a few years now. Um, to be honest with you guys, uh, or anyone that's watching, I've just always been very. I've never been as big on the. Well, my businesses may be big on business to business or business to person. Me personally, I'm big on person to person, and that's one of the reasons why I've really been trying to kind of build my brand very strongly into the social media aspect. Um, I feel like it creates you know a lot of good transparency and one to one interaction with people, and that's something that I really value, um, especially as you know things kind of start to move away from that more personal interaction. And again, you know, like I said, that's that's really big for me. Um, I'm in the middle of launching a few projects. Um, I unfortunately I don't want to speak to them uh, before they're launched in case they don't happen. But that's just because I have a lot on my plate. But nonetheless, like I said, I've definitely got a lot going on. Um, and if you want to know more, I'd be glad to talk to you guys. Like I said, you know, it's it's nice to meet everyone. And like, um, and I'm definitely glad, you know, looking forward to hearing more about you guys and your uh, social media endeavors as well. All right. Jake, you're up next, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm Jake Title. I'm the president at Outlier Marketing and Design. I'm 26 years old, and I live in Capitola, California, which is in the middle of Northern California. I've been in the social media game for about two and a half years, just loving it every minute of it, and just building um, a, a huge empire, to say the least, of just leading with value and helping out as many businesses as I can and I absolutely love social media and I can't wait to share uh, the insights I have of everything that I've done to build up to what I've done today. All right, fantastic. And now Michael. Sweet. I am happy to be on this hangout with some awesome guys, some awesome people, um, some social media powerhouses I'd say. Um, All right, everybody. My name is Michael Jacobs. I am a 21-year-old entrepreneur. Um, I love to hustle. I love to work hard and make things happen. Um, And right now, my current company is Socialink App. It's a mobile application that simplifies networking and connecting uh, on social media. So, uh, yeah, if you guys have an iPhone, uh, just hit it up on the iTunes App Store, Socialink with one L, and Android will be coming out soon. But uh, yeah, I'm just super passionate about social media, about creating relationships, and I'm stoked to talk about it with you guys today. Yeah, I ran into that uh, problem earlier trying to find your uh, app. I kept typing in two L's, and GoDaddy has that page uh, listed as just you know available for sales. So you may want to consider that. And uh, I think uh, Omid, you're the last one we got on here. You don't have a camera though, man. You're just uh, uh, I did, I have a camera. I just I'm not really well dressed, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at home in my pajamas. Well, um, you know that's that's the joy of being uh, uh, able to work in the new age, right? You can dress however you want to. You just gotta learn to put a regular shirt on with your pajamas on the bottom, and you're good. Yeah, Smart that's, guy. I mean, that's the dream is to live this way. <laughs> um, so I own a company called Ardent Kid. Uh, it's my own startup, uh, and I'm primarily investing my time in building games, uh, so mobile applications, and that's why I'm interested in this conversation. Cool. Fantastic. So uh, what kind of games do you build? Um, I have one that I launched. Uh, actually, my first one that I launched recently is called Marshmallow Ninja. Uh, and now <laughs> it's, it's kind of a small game. Um, I spent about a year working on a, a big game that I never launched, so that's kind of been put aside because 
uh, I kind of ran out of funds and I just need to you know, put stuff in the market. So I'm trying that for a while. That's cool. Cool. All right. Well, um, guys, I know uh, I'd asked uh, Michael yesterday, and I kind of talked about this. And since this is kind of streaming through our group, or it will be once I get everything straightened out and the new links posted, um, you know, as as young people coming in, being business owners, um, and getting started, how important do you think uh, networking is through social media? that an advantage you have versus like when I was growing up. I mean, when I was your age, guys, just to let you know, we still communicated with a wired telephone that had an 80-foot cord in our house that, you know, you had to rotary dial on. So I know I'm making myself sound old here. I do love technology, but just kind of give me your feedback on where you think um, normal, everyday, you know, 35, 30-plus 30 age people are missing out on social media and where they should be going. And, you know, you guys can start anywhere you want to, and we'll just kind of go from there. Whoever wants to fire up an answer first, knock yourself out. I'll start it off. All right, man. So the social media is absolutely huge. Um, as you see, I, I'm sure you've heard of Gary Vaynerchuk and all these other um, superstars. Oh, yeah. But one thing that Gary said that I've been really paying a, a really a, a a lot of attention to is the mobile age and how everyone's becoming more mobile and um, everything is switching towards uh, just a really easy way to get online and, and be able to be seen by a lot of different people all at once. So being mobile and, and having that presence online and doing the whole, you know, a lot of my, the way I've built my business is through Facebook, but then I've branched out into other um, areas as well like I've met Michael through Twitter and Daniel through Facebook and you know just a lot of these other guys on here um, just through a lot of different platforms but I would say my main one is Facebook and um, that's that's the way I've started yeah you know I think that Jake makes a couple really good points there I think the the difference between the way that we think about social media and the way that a lot of other people think about social media is um, I, I, a lot of the times I hear people afraid to really go online and, and to reach out to people and to meet new people. Um, but really the way that I look at social media as, is it's kind of the same thing as, as if I went down to the grocery store down the street and, and talked to the guy down there and made a friend with him. Um, it just allows us to connect uh, a lot of different places and, and in different areas at, at a larger scale to that. And I think that that's really um, a point that's really missed on social media a lot is the fact that people get really afraid of, of who's on the other end, you know, who's on the other end of the Facebook page or the Twitter page, um, when really that doesn't really matter too much. You should go into social media thinking of it as a tool where you can meet some like-minded people and you can uh, create some cool content and just be yourself, you know, just go out there and... And don't be afraid to reach out to people and, and just utilize it to your best benefit. Yeah, and definitely have to agree with a lot of those points that you guys are bringing up. Uh, you know, kind of specific to when you're talking about, say, an elder generation that's not as new to, say, the technology side that obviously much of us are very, you know, in line with. Uh, I always like to think that, you know, again, getting away from that fear and, you know, misunderstanding of social media being this scary place that, you know, there's always random people that are coming at you and you don't know what to do. You know, when I joined, like, if I think back to when I started in social media, I mean, if you're going back, it's Friendster in MySpace if you guys really want to draw it back. And the reason very much that I did that was because I wanted to connect with friends and family. And, you know, obviously as you transition forward in technology and time, we hit Facebook and, you know, Twitter and all these different things. And it had to kind of grow from that, that, that comfortable, you know, familiarity with talking to friends and family where it's like, okay, well, you know, if there's these hundreds and millions of people out there and, you know, being like a person that maybe isn't even outgoing, it, it being online, whether, I mean, obviously video kind of brings it back, it actually kind of abstracts out that normal, uh, it's almost, you know, like asking someone on a date, there's that fear and that unknown, and that still exists in social media, but the cool thing is, like I said, it kind of abstracts part of that away where, you can almost, in a sense, hide behind, and I don't mean to be, say, not be transparent about the person that you are, but you, you kind of eliminate part of where that fear usually exists with interacting with people, and that's one thing I think that, you know, I always like when people do ask me of, an, of a different generation is, you know, how do I get into the social media thing? And it's to understand that, that that does get taken away, and you have kind of that 
almost that more pro that protection, that cloak that lets you be able to go out and try to interact with people. And then if it, you know, like you know, like Jake said and you know, Mike said when we had first started, it was just very much you know, commenting and, and just very light, you know, interaction, but now we're on video calls and I've been on the phone with these guys. I've actually met Michael in person and they flourished into these, you know, amazing relationships with these great people. And I think that's the other big part is to know that, you know, while there is tons of people out there that you may never sync up with and they may not be on the same page as you, there is just as many people out there on the opposite end that do have that like mind and that passion or that interest or that hobby that you may have. That's that's a huge point right there, um, and I'd like to feed off of that a little bit. I really like the fact what Daniel said is is the fact that you meet people online and then you move it into in person relationships, and that's a hundred percent true. I met Jake about uh, two or three months ago. I met uh, Dan about a month ago, maybe now, and literally it it's it's flourished into a stronger relationship because we started online, we met on Facebook, Twitter, whatever it was moved into some phone calls, moved into some Skype calls, met in person, and it, it's just the same thing as building any normal relationship. And I think that's what people don't realize. They think it's completely different or, or completely separate when really it's it's the same thing. I look at these guys as my best friends. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think um, social networks allow us to accelerate it? Uh, because, I mean, one of the things that I've found is that, you know, when you start interacting with people on Facebook and Twitter and, and other places that a lot of the barriers aren't there. You know, if you meet somebody in person, if you go to like a business meeting or something like that, you tend to be um, a little more conscious of how you uh, come across to people or how you uh, appear to people, you know, whether or not you have the right shirt on or, you know, you're dressed appropriately where I think on, on Facebook uh, and on a lot of other places because there is that wall of anonymity even though you know people there's still the internet in between us so you tend to be a little more real in what you post and what you say and the question you ask and how you open up and talk to people um, I know this is gonna sound like a weird transition but several years ago when I first got divorced I started doing online dating and talking to people and things like that and I was amazed at how quickly people would develop extremely strong feelings for people that they may have never met in person or anything else and you know it became then a psychological study on how do people interact when there's not this barrier of the physical you know because if you think about it if you go to a meeting or someplace and you're there you're very conscious of yourself and how you stand and everything else whereas when you meet online it's more of what are you thinking what are your ideas and what are your concepts and that physicality is not there so the emotions and the speed of relationship seems to be faster. What do you think about that? I actually like that point a lot. I never really thought of it about that in that perspective, but I do agree with you there. I think that um, on social media, um, I think that it can grow faster. I don't think it necessarily does every single time. I think it really depends on how open you are to the relationships and, and your mindset in general. Um, but in my personal experience, I've been pretty open to meeting people and, and to growing, and I have been able to to see that. Yeah, it, it's really sped up the relationship process, you know, because I think one of the really big reasons that it speeds it up is the fact that you can go on my Facebook profile and you can, in five minutes, know everything that I'm doing, all the projects I'm working on, what I'm truly passionate about, how how I take uh, how I work day to day, you know. And just by going on someone's Facebook or their Twitter, you can grasp so much information about their personality, about who they are, and about what they really, truly are 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 passionate about. Because a lot of people don't share that in the initial first conversation when you have a, a phone call or meet someone in person. You know? No, I think that's a that's a great point. You're right. Is that uh, if you meet somebody in a meeting and you talk to them for two minutes, you may forget about them. But mm -hmm. if you meet him on Facebook or someplace and you go to bed or you're wiped out and I've got insomnia, I can scroll through, I can stalk you, you know, learn everything about you. You've got links to your pages, links to your posts. You can kind exactly. of get a feel for people very quickly, whereas if you meet them once, 5, 10, 15 minutes, it's not quite that same thing. So have you other guys found well that when you meet people online, it seems to accelerate your relationship versus if you met them in public? Absolutely. I like, I for me personally... Um, I built a really strong friendship with uh, Kim Garst. Um, I don't know if you guys know that, are familiar with that name, but uh, Kim Garst has been listed in Forbes magazine as top 50 most influential people in social media. And there's no way I would have been able to meet her since she lives in Florida and I live over here in California. 
but you know it's just because of my engagement, my transparency, and how open I was online and just responsive to that. How is how we built the friendship we have now today? Exactly. I think that's a perfect example. Um, and I'm gonna feed off of that a little bit. I think you can reach out to people who you normally wouldn't think would talk to you. You know what I mean? You you normally wouldn't expect to have a conversation with Kim Gars, but now you're good friends with her. And a good example is like I normally wouldn't jump on a video chat with Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, but I can shoot him two tweets and, and he shoots me a tweet and says, yeah, I'm doing this hangout right now. Come ask me a few questions. And, and it just gives you the opportunity to connect with people who not only are powerhouses but are inspirations to you yourself. And by getting on a call with one of those people or just reaching out to them and them just responding with a smiley face, you know, you, you get more motivation, you get more drive from it. Yeah, and you know, I, I think what people don't realize too is how it can um, float, that you can expand beyond just where you meet them. Like, I'm not active in Twitter a whole lot anymore. I used to be a couple years ago. And when I was, I actually met somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and ended up going to work for Mark Joyner, who's the founder of uh, Simpleology, for about uh, right at two years. Whereas normally, I wouldn't have those connections and wouldn't have that interaction. And mm -hmm. then because of working for him, ended up uh, becoming friends with Matt Basak and a couple other people that are, you know, been in the internet marketing world for a really long time. And there, none of that would have started had it not been for a tweet where I responded to somebody else. And I think that's what people miss is that this is a relationship. You know, it's interaction. It's talking. It's seeing somebody post something and, and interact with somebody and saying, you know what? that's really cool. Let me interact with them. And uh, you see a lot of business owners, and I know uh, I'm asking because of myself and other business owners I know, putting the business first before they put the personality and that really causing them problems in building their relationships. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, I used to do that in the very beginning, you know, when I first really started on networking on Facebook and, and Twitter, etc. Um, like I really only wanted to push my product, you know. I only wanted to push social and, and constantly have people tell me what they thought of it, give me their opinions, you know. And then I began to like calm myself down a little bit after the hype of launching the first venture, you know. And, and I began to realize the fact that it wasn't working effectively. Like the the fact that I wasn't being genuine about what I was talking about. I only really cared about my business side of it. Um, really was a huge realization for me. And and after I began to realize that, I said like honestly, it, it it doesn't matter like about the business side of it. Like the business side of it will work its work itself out. You know, I'm trying to meet some cool people and and build some relationships with like-minded individuals. And I think that really really hit for me after I had a few couple conversations with like Jake and, and uh, these guys over here was the fact that when we weren't we weren't even talking about business and we had such a like-minded uh, attitude and a like mind that we just couldn't stop talking you know we'd get on a two hour hang and that's really when it hit me the power of social media is more for the like-minded individuals rather than uh, and searching for like-minded individuals rather than trying to push your company out I definitely agree with you Alan. Um, just kinda to segue off of that um, there was a saying I heard recently that always kind of hit back to a lot of what I noticed with making like good social media branding and getting engaged users and that's I'd always rather have four quarters than a hundred pennies and very much saying that you know I could have a hundred people that are you know, that are on my you know, like my Facebook page but if I post something and nobody interacts with it or really doesn't care or it's not they're not the audience you know what is what was the point of even going with that you know I'd rather have four people that are genuinely interested in say the product or the service or what we're talking about and being actively engaged in that and you know a lot of people kinda of lose sight of that when they you know they, they they build these social media brands or they they try to you know market themselves and grow that and is that you know like Mike said the business kinda of works itself out but you know coming from the reason I come to you know came to this conclusion myself outside of actually being part of that social media game is actually I come from a user experience and design background even before my programming and especially when you're in user experience where specifically it is you know everything I was doing was based around the users 
Um, it's very similar in design, it becomes very similar in programming, and it becomes very similar in my marketing where I'm building user-centric things that actually make it worth engaging. And, you know, like, like uh, Jake said earlier, and that's actually not only getting them to engage but offer value back and forth because just as much as a business is, you know, has their product and doing what they're doing, there's actually a value that you can draw back off the people that you are trying to, say, solicit or, like I said, engage and I think okay. that's a, you know a huge miss for a lot of businesses, and that's why it's almost you know like a best example of where it's kind of playing that catch-up game is you know I see a lot of like very large corporate businesses starting to be like oh man like this social media stuff is blowing up, and all these small to mid businesses are just absolutely killing it because they build such good brands around this social media side, especially the ones that are actively engaging their users, taking that feedback, and using it to improve their business and their products and their services. I love that. Great answer, Dan. And by the way, just for the record, a lot of this stuff, half me, half these guys. These two guys that you're looking <laughs> at, Michael and Jacob, are, I'm sorry, Michael and Jake are absolutely phenomenal. And I can definitely say that not only just being part of working inside of this, you know, this the social media and branding and marketing, just watching these guys do what they do has helped me so much, especially Jake. Um, I haven't, I like I said, I've known Jake the longest now, and I've built, me and him have just this absolutely, I'd say, ridiculous amount of rapport with each other. And I just, you know, again, I'm I, just like, you know, a business trying to pick up on what users want or their customers, whatever it is in that case, I do the same thing with these guys. And that's a lot of where I think you can really start to learn is, is, watching the people that are building that strong user engagement while simultaneously running an effective business. You know, it's, it's that balance between both, but understanding the, how to leverage each and how to put the time in, you know, into one or the other, but keeping them always remember that you have to be here at some point. Wow, that was totally off balance on the camera, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, dude. I love that. Scott, yeah, you're muted, Scott. Yeah, you're muted, Scott. <laughs> yeah, now. Now am I muted still? No, you're nope, good. you're good to go. Okay, yeah, cool. I don't, I don't know when I muted me. Somebody muted me. So it's your guy's <laughs> fault. I'm going to blame it on somebody else. I know you guys are good. But, you know, if you've read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, one of the things that he said caused those people to become so wealthy was the concept of a mastermind. You know, we have them all to, together today. And while you guys don't refer to what you're creating as a mastermind, that's really what you're doing, though. You're finding like-minded people with talents and skills that are at your level or above to help you grow so that you can be the success that you want to be. And that's something that before social media, Google Hangouts and all these things became prevalent were extremely difficult to do. You know, if you lived in a small town, the people you were going to hang out with were the people that ran the local grocery store. And they may not have the skills that you need to take you to where you want to be, but now with Facebook, you can connect with people that are doing 10 times what you're doing to say, hey, let me watch and learn and interact with you and see how can we grow to do those things. And I think that's one of the things that people miss out so much on this is that, you know, it costs, you know, if you have nothing, 250 bucks, you get a Chromebook, you can do Google Hangouts, you can be on Facebook, you can do anything you want to, and you can meet people doing really cool things and grow your business and grow your relationships. <laughs> and when you run into a tech problem, you go find a tech person and say, I don't know how to do this. And a lot of them, it's amazing, you ask, and people are just willing to go, here, let me show you how to fix that. Exactly. And, That's so true. I love that. I think the, the asking part is huge. And, and to feed off of your previous point, I think we are creating a mastermind. I think that's a great word to use for it because... I mean, even even on an off day, I can reach out to Jake, or I can reach out to Dan or Karan over here who just joined us, and I can say, hey guys, you know, like I'm really struggling with this right now. Like, what do you guys think about it? And they'll come back with three complete different perspectives, three complete different answers that allow me to get more clarity on my situation and on the issue that I'm facing, you know? And I think that's really the power of social media is the fact that you can meet all of these people. They're just out there waiting. You just need to take the initiative. You need to have the confidence to just go do it and, and get on phone calls with people and, and make shit happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just, just one interesting one to go with that. Uh, so one of the things that I work on in my outside of my social media stuff, specifically to my businesses and my work, is a lot of personal and professional development coaching. 
And one thing that I consistently hear, um, I'm very focused on say people in that you know, post, post high school, mid college, maybe graduating for their first big job. And that's like Mike says, actually asking for the job or asking for what's the next step. And that's one of those kind of things like it's the same thing with social media. It's, it's, you know, a friend request or a follow is essentially your first step in asking or trying to go out and facilitate that on your own. And when you actually do start to facilitate, that's how you make things happen. You know, action or motion creates motion. That's one of my favorite sayings. And even more so these last couple of months, you know, trying to just put that best foot forward and really start just reaching out and talking to people and getting to know them and finding out what's, what's driving them, you know, Asking those questions is how you start building those relationships that we're talking about. And, you know, the more you do it, the stronger it becomes. And, and the funny thing is, is that it doesn't always have to be something that does go into a, into a, into a perfect relationship. Because, you know, just like an interview, you know, you're asking people, you know, to tell them about them, tell them about, tell you about themselves. And it's your job as well to figure out, you know, is this the kind of relationship or the type of network or a contact or whatever that is that I want to be connected to? And, you know, in, like, the case I've had with, with Jake and Michael, that's very much been the case where we have very, you know, similar passions and focuses. And while we may not work in the same businesses, you know, we're on that same page to quite a, you know, to a very big degree that allows us to really, again, build those relationships. And then from there, you know, again, it's almost, it's just a tree. You know, it's a, it's a set of roots that just keep expanding. And we're looking for, you know, where are those next best relationships and how can we help each other empower those? Exactly. And I think a big point, to jump in here again that, that Dan just made there was the fact that we're not all in the same industry like I'm in the mobile app industry Jake's completely in the marketing and design industry uh, Dan's working on all his things in, in coding and things like that you know we're all in different things we're all passionate about different things but at the same time we're still able to provide value to each other because I'll say hey Jake I, I found I met someone today who needs some help in some design work and some marketing work uh, let me introduce you to him. And Jake will hit me up and say, hey, man, I met this person later earlier who, who really would use your app and would really like your app. You should probably reach out to him. And it's just <coughs> pure collaboration, and, and it's amazing. It's amazing the power that it actually has. Yeah, it all starts with building trust, though, first. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And, like, these two guys on either side of me, I've just built, it's been cool to – see what has happened because of social media like I've never would have met these two without the power of social media and it's I mean like Michael was saying and, and Dan was saying it's just like they're like my best friends now and it's all through you know through the social media and how we've we built the the friendship the way it is mm -hmm. and how often we stay in contact absolutely exactly so if you got somebody new who's just getting started in this where would you tell them to get started I mean you know which because we all know there's so many social networks out there that it's almost impossible to stay active in all of them. So where would you get started or recommend somebody new to, to kind of get their feet wet, to start building relationships, to maybe you know grow a business, start a business, or any of those kinds of things? Send a friend request to Jake. On that Google Plus style. You know, w one thing I would say about that is – well, like personally, like my thing, you know, and again, any entrepreneur will tell you this and definitely and the other two guys can tell you I'm working on this myself is to create focus on each area. And me personally, like my brand, I've built it across many of the social networks, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to starting out, I personally think that depending on the business or the service that you're providing, <laughs> it's well worth considering the network that you start on and put the most focus on. And the reason I say that is, is that, so I work in technology primarily, and as much as I hate to say it, Google Plus is a nerd, nerd fest. It is very technology driven. I mean, there's a lot more to it, and it's growing, which has been amazing. But when I first started, especially, it was very technology driven. It felt like, you know, like if I wanted to talk to fellow uh, nerds or developers like myself, that was the place to start. And I did do that. And that's why I always like to say is, you know, be cognizant of your business and your service and then kind of play that into what each of those networks can offer you because, you know, Facebook can be really whatever you want it to be, um, and so can Twitter and Google+, Plus. but maybe there's a place that you could position yourself best. So like I said, for my position as a technologist or as a developer, Google+, Plus made sense for me to <sighs> utilize as a place to push, say, the learning that I was offering or that kind of value. And again, that can apply across the board, but it's, it's really where should you position yourself to start and put that most focus. Well, again... 
like I said earlier, you know, eventually that balance has to come back into play and it becomes, okay, now where should I step this, you know, this, this brand forward or this business or product and start now taking what I did here and applying it in this medium because as much as they all are all social networks, they do all work differently, especially Twitter. That's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But it's, like I said, it's definitely worth knowing your positioning when you start out and where you can best play that. I love that answer. I think I think that's definitely right. I think that um, kind of just start off with where what feels right. You know, if if you're feeling that you're creating content and you're you're creating followers on Twitter and and <laughs> creating relationships there, start there. But if it's Facebook, start at Facebook. You know, um, I th- I just say start where you're best accustomed and where you have the most knowledge already, um, because each and every social media does have a learning curve, although we can, as young people, can just kind of jump in and learn it quickly. There is still some learning curve, so yeah, just just do what you know from the beginning and expand from there. Uh, just one thing, too, actually, to go with, Scott, something you were talking about earlier, um, which was you had mentioned about, like, online dating, um, and just kind of, again, to go with Mike as well, and that is that you know, utilizing that kind of, it's almost its almost like a free bonus point that social networks and online or just in general the internet gives you that you don't have that in-person worrying about maybe not necessarily ju- being judgmental whether it's a positive or a negative, but you gain that kind of uh, empty confidence factor that allows you to do these things. So, you know, when you pick, if, it's, if it comes down to, like I said, you know, I was talking about positioning and knowing best where to start, if you don't know that, if you're working in social media already or you're kind of all around, you know, the different, you know, the different areas, start with the one that you are most confident in or the one you are most prevailing in. Like I said, for me, Facebook has been my number one. It's where I've had the most connections and the most success, the most engagement, you know, and if that's, if you're similar where one specifically is, you know, like, I like, I like this one, I know it the best, start there and then branch yourself out. Like I said, you want to give... You know, it's very easy, especially when you don't have a measurable amount of success in something, to feel very discouraged to not press forward with that. So, you know, give yourself that extra confidence and start working on the one you know the best and allow yourself to see, you know, what can I do here, where can I improve, and make those little changes that can, you know, start to give you a point where measurable success is, you know, within an earshot or something that you can literally measure. Exactly. Love it. Totally totally agree with these guys. Uh, one thing I would... I mean, I started personally on Facebook because I knew a lot of the audience, my niche was in that realm and there was a lot of people talking on there. So I got really familiar with Facebook first and foremost, that's where I started out, and then kind of branched out and, you know, now I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, all the <laughs> all the above, but my main focus first and foremost was Facebook and building the relationships there, and then it just kind of led into other things once I got really comfortable with that. But then I'm still trying to get comfortable with Twitter. I mean, that's a whole different story. That's like sending to someone so text people. messages. Yeah, there's so many people and there's so many. Well, I, I mentioned yesterday to Michael that, you know, Twitter is one of those things that I just, it's hard to wrap your head around. It's like drinking from a fire hose. You know, there's so much stuff <laughs> going by there that I, it's like a raging river going by. So somebody tweets something, and if you happen to be there when it happens, you can interact and you can get some great back and forth going and some great flow of ideas and everything else. But if you come in two hours later, it's gone. You know, it's way down the road. And anytime you try to get involved in, it's like they're looking at you going, that was so, you know, 90 minutes ago, so two hours. It's so hard to find things after they're gone, too, on, on Twitter, really. Very true. Exactly. Um, and by the way, Karen, we now have you in and participating. I had you. I, I forgot I'd said it so that new people came in off stage, and I kept trying to figure out why you were grayed out there. So you are now official, man. You're That's right. It was actually because my other account that I was going to use is is under eighteen, which I really am. So I had to switch to a different account because it wouldn't have been <laughs> streaming. So you're lying to everybody now, saying you're over eighteen. <laughs> the struggle is being a young entrepreneur, I guess, right? <laughs> By the way, uh, just one thing about Twitter that I would say, I, I'd be lying if I said that Twitter was my strongest platform. In fact, I find it to be one of the toughest. Um, but one of the things that I always loved about Twitter, and maybe this is because I come from a design, a design UX background, is that when when you're on Twitter, you have 140 characters. And while well, most people, you know, my, even my initial, I remember when I joined Twitter back, I think it was like 08, and it was, what the hell am I going to do with 140 characters, you know? And... It was before I know, knew the word microblogging, but what I came what I to the realization, realization more recently than not is that with Twitter, in 140 characters, you were forced to get your point across. 
And that's like I said, for me and be coming from a design background where, you know, my job is to get across a certain message or a point or a brand, you know, Twitter is exactly that where you have the specific very short amount of space to tell in, you know, I'm sure you guys have done this where you have, you notice that little counter and you get past and you're like, okay, how can I rewrite this point to hit that 140 now? Okay, shorten the link. Ah, oh, crud, I still got, I'm at 175. You know, and that's that's one thing that's cool about Twitter, and I think it actually helps a lot with with writing and um, creating you know purposeful things to say. You know, it's very easy to you know roll on and on the things that you're going to say, but Twitter is almost kind of like that cutting point where it's how, how can you best say what you need to say in that limit because you are limited to doing that. Exactly, I love well, that. I, I absolutely love that because that's something that I struggle with daily when I'm trying to send tweets. <laughs> Amen. I keep forgetting to turn off my mic when I'm not talking, so you guys won't hear my echo. Um, well, you know, you made that comment though about shortening it down. That Twitter forces you to do that. It, have you ever heard the old story that you know a guy comes up and he's asking this guy and he needs him to give a speech and he says, "Look, it's going to be a three-hour speech." And the guy's like, "Oh, fine, I can talk three hours right now. It's no problem." And he comes back to him a little while later and he says, "Hey, I need you to do a 40-minute speech." And he goes, "Oh, I'll need at least two weeks to get ready for a 40-minute speech." And he goes. Well, okay, and he gives him the time, and he comes back later, and he says, "Look, I just need to give an eight-minute speech." And he goes, eight minutes will take me at least six months to get ready for." You know, <laughs> for us to to channel down our ideas, it's easy to talk about a subject you know for three hours. But if you only have five minutes, or 140 characters, or 10 minutes, you know, in uh, marketing they often refer to it as the elevator pitch, right? You've got the time from the tenth floor to the basement. To make your pitch, tell them what you are, who you are, what you do, and why they should invest in you, and that's difficult. You know, you ask most business owners, "What do you do?" and they go, "Well, let me talk for the next five days." You know, and it's <laughs> something that Twitter forces you to do in real time. Learn to think: How do I make it concise and short, and just cut and gut everything <laughs> that's not necessary? That's why I'm glad they let you do pictures and everything else on Twitter now. So you know, very true. And one, one thing about Twitter that I've noticed in my experience is that sometimes you can get lucky and you can really, like, when I see somebody who I want to network with and they don't accept a friend request or something, even if we have, like, 20 mutual friends, like, people, for example, like Alan Wong, I, I've been, like, resending that a couple times for, like, months now, <laughs> and it's probably never going to happen, but I, I, have, I have a lot of people who could put me in touch with them if I wanted to, uh, but I don't have any, like, specific questions for them, so I haven't done that, but... Like, there's been a couple times where I've tweeted him, and he'll get back to you, because there's, there's just kind of that, it's just crazy on Twitter. There's there's no, like, friend requests or anything. It's just, you just answer things and ask things, and, like, Richard Branson retweeted something that my friend tweeted somehow. I mean, like, you can get to people a lot easier if you get lucky, but like you were saying, if they miss it and it's buried, you know, 20 minutes later, then it's gone, so. Yeah, it's I agree with you there, Karan. I agree with you there. I think to feed off of that point a little bit, um, it's really all about timing, and that's what I've really noticed with Twitter. Um, one of the really effective tools with Twitter is actually inside the app itself. If you go on your mobile device, you have the ability to turn on your notifications um, for specific people. So when I'm really trying to... Yeah, when I'm trying to reach out to someone, what I do is I turn on those mobile notifications so that as soon as that person sends a tweet, or, or anything at all, I will be notified of it immediately. And the power of that really is because of Twitter, you need to catch people when they're on Twitter, you, you, especially uh, high up people. Um, if mm -hmm. you tweet someone who has 100,000 followers, um, they're not going to see it unless they're on Twitter at that exact second. Right, yeah, exactly. And, and exactly, and that's kind of the, the value that I've seen in turning on the mobile notifications is that you can catch people at that optimum time at that exact moment where they send a tweet so you have a better chance of reaching celebrities and, and reaching people um, who you're trying to reach who normally you wouldn't be able to talk to. And it works. It really works, definitely. It does work. Yeah, I, I had Emma Watson retweet me because I used that <laughs> tactic one time. Wow. <laughs> you know what's funny, actually? Um, kind of similar to Emma Watson. Uh, you know, I definitely can agree that timing is very, very important, especially for the people that do, you know, even as low as forty to fifty thousand followers, upwards of the of the mil, of you know almost a million, if not more, uh, is that even just opening conversation with them, if it's a genuine conversation, again, like we said, you know, opening that asking for it kind of thing, 
is the same thing. I've um, let's see, um, one of my good friends uh, has talk, he's big on Entourage if you know that series, and he's tweeted to all the women that he's in love with on that show, and they've responded. <laughs> so I actually tried something similar, which was uh, Ariana Huffington uh, was on Bill Maher's show, and all I did was compliment her on her on her being part of that panel, and she actually ended up responding back to me. Now I can't say whether or not that was a social media team. But just seeing that happen and knowing that that's someone that I think she has just under a million followers, if not more now, because it was about a year ago, uh, that opening that conversation is the way to start, you know, no matter what the network is. You know, obviously, again, you know, not having that friend request, as Karan mentioned, you know, some of those networks can be tougher to reach out on. But if you can't find them on, if you can't get them on one, more than likely you've got options because there's a lot of networks out there, even if you're talking about just the top tier ones like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram is another good one one we haven't talked about yet. Um, but like I said, be willing to put your hand out there because you never know who's going to grab back onto it. And I, I think that's, that initiative thing is definitely what everybody overlooks because as Michael and I were talking about yesterday, especially with me probably more so than him because he's a little older, um, when, when you talk to people about what you're do doing who are not any sort of entrepreneur or anything, they'll say, "Man, I wish I could do that." You know, I, I wish I could could do the things you're doing, but it's it's like, and then I, I respond by saying, "It's it's not about that." You know, like I'm not special in that way. It's just the reason I have a part time job editing at Secret Entourage, and and the reason that I've I've made all these contacts, and the the fact that I'm on this call with you guys right now, is just because I've made the initiative to just reach out to people. And, and I think a lot of people are afraid of that because they're afraid of that in real life. Like uh, like Scott was saying about that whole barrier there, but because that doesn't exist, you're more likely, or at least I'm more likely, and other people are, to just reach out to people. Because the worst thing that happens is, you know, they say no, or they don't accept your friend request, or they don't retweet you. I mean, it's that simple. And if they do, which is the only positive outcome, the only really possible outcome other than rejection, is that you form a relationship, which is really, really cool to see. And it's exactly. not like the word no to heart. Because exactly. it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you personally. It's just sometimes it's a no, you know, and that's like I said exactly. same thing when I go back to professional coaching. You know, a lot of people take things very personally, like Karan said with Alan Wong. I know that Karan knows that Alan Wong, who is, just in case you guys don't know, he's a programmer, uh, does mobile apps, Absolutely. very, very talented and very wealthy young man. It's not a personal thing for someone to say no to you. Um, mm -hmm. It's just... For them, whatever the case may be, it wasn't the relationship for them, which again, which is why opening up that networking and, and building those strong relationships with other people and almost, again, you know, kind of circumnavigating around your network and eventually having someone be like, like, listen, Alan, I got this guy, Karan, and he is awesome. You need to talk to him. That's that's how things, you know, kind of flourish and, and open themselves up. And exactly. it almost is, it's, it's not as much a game of chance as it is a game of just, again, opening up the doors by make, opening interactions in other ways and letting them circumnavigate to come back to you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I like that point you made, Dan. I think that it's not all, it's also not just about, like, that you sending a friend request and then not accepting. It might not be the right time, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, at least for me, I really believe that, that things come into your life at a very specific time that, that You've uh, that you've pretty much attracted into your life, and and that they'll be useful in that period of time, and and to get them any earlier, they would be less useful. And I think that it's the same thing with kind of meeting people online. I've had a, a few people who I've sent friend requests to, and you know they haven't responded for four or five months, you know. But but once they mm -hmm. hear about me through another friend, or they see me chatting exactly. with one of their friends on Facebook. Uh, they'll accept it and they'll be more open to it. So you just got to realize. I can't count that, how many times that's happened to me. <laughs> exactly. You just got to realize that everybody's different. You know, everybody has a different perspective on life and a different outlook on on the way that friendships should be made, especially on social media. So just be respectful to that and and uh, be patient as well. Absolutely. Well, one one thing I will tell you guys that I, I learned from a, a guy who's really good at networking on Facebook is if you're in groups with somebody. When you send them a friend request, let them know inside the group. If you're chatting with them, like if you've had a discussion going on, just say, hey, man, I sent you a friend request. Because a lot of these guys, they may have 150, 200, 300 friend mm -hmm. requests that are just kind of queued up, and they don't ever go look at them. So unless somebody says or they know to go look for it, hey, I need to go look for this guy and I can find him. I've had several people that had done that a year ago, sent them friend requests, forgot all about it, didn't think about it. Happened to be in a couple of Facebook groups with him. We were talking. I gave him some good ideas. And I was like, oh, I was like, hey, you know, I sent you a friend request. And the next thing I know, 10 minutes later, he's accepted it. But they have to know to go look for it, especially, you know, like you were mentioning on Twitter, 100,000, 200,000 million fans. 
million followers, it gets lost in the stream. Whereas if you can get that one-on-one -on -one connection in Facebook groups, which if you guys are not in any Facebook groups, you need to be. Um, <laughs> they're a great way to interact and build that connection with people in a, in a much more personal way because you can even tag them inside of groups even if you're not friends with them. So you can call them out. You can get that interaction. It's, <laughs> it's a great tool and technique. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't started your own group, go start one. You know, even if it's Young Guns Masterminds or whatever that you want to put in there to get people in and involved, you can start building your own tribe, as Seth Godin refers to it, right now, so that when your product does launch, or if it's something you're working on goes, you've got a group of people that already know, like, and trust you, and they're ready to buy from you. Absolutely. 100% agree with that. Yeah, I think that that's, that's right there. I think you just summarized the power of social media, you know, right there. Yeah. You know, one, two, to go with what you were saying about the groups. Um, one, just kind of if anyone's, um, I don't know if anyone's a big LinkedIn user outside of just using it as a resume tool. Um, one thing that I found really effective lately, and I'm planning on writing up a little bit more on this soon, is so if you guys notice, they have their news section now, and basically it's, you know, the top tier. Unfortunately, you can't connect with them, guys that are writing articles on, you know, various things, especially in the entrepreneurial world. I find a lot of great, you know, articles there. And if you look, you can you can comment on these articles now and respond to people as you know like a normal <laughs> comment thread. Uh, but what I noticed was is when I had started doing that, um, I started kind of focusing on technology, and then I started to kind of go to the business and the you know development side. And as I would you know comment and make you know professional, but also you know engaging you know something engaging worth worth mentioning about you know what the content of the article was or someone else's comment to it that I would go to that, you know, recently viewed section of my LinkedIn and all of a sudden it would jump up to 15, 20 people that I had no idea who they were. And like I said, so, you know, in you know, regards to a group and kind of with LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn is another one where I think that a lot of people think it's like, it, it's this, it's the lame version of Facebook. It's not, it has to be professional. It's, it's this, it's that. It's just another social network. I do love, I love the branding as being the professional side of it, but there's a huge market there of talking to people and interacting with with almost kind of that, you know, that forced professional side where that is the way that that network is and, you know, the way that you present yourself there and, you know, maybe say dictate yourself as a, you know, an expert in whatever field you work in. You know, there's a lot lot to be said there. So like I said, for if you're talking, if you know, we were talking earlier about how to attack one of these networks, you know, LinkedIn, I found that, like I said, commenting on articles that people write, read and offering good value in your comment or, like I said, responding in um, either argument, not in a fighting way, but I mean a positive way. Um, can really lead to a lot of success in finding people there. And I've been able to find some great new contacts across LinkedIn that I'll probably never work with in my entire life, but I definitely can say that they're another contact that I can reach out to and interact with and you know, get their feedback and kind of, again, start building that relationship out to the other networks. Exactly. Love it. And I think groups on LinkedIn is another one of those places where people don't get involved in them a lot. The, the groups that are on face, uh, LinkedIn tend to be very technical. I mean, uh, I'm in half a dozen of them that, you know, the people that are there, you know, you'd mentioned Google Plus being for like geeks and nerds. You can find business groups and nerd groups in the whole nine yards on LinkedIn because they're there. And if they work in a corporation, their corporation won't block LinkedIn because they can say, oh, it's a professional organization, but they may block Facebook. They may block Google Plus or they may block some of the other more social networks where you just kind of hang out. Whereas LinkedIn is like, well, that's where I find professional relationships and, uh, you know, I vet my vendors and do all this kind of stuff. So if you're looking for that truly business first relationship, LinkedIn's a great place to start as well as the groups. Uh, and you can do searches and find anything you want. And inside those groups, again, you can start interacting. As you mentioned, those people you may never talk to any other place, but there you'll see them and you'll meet them and be able to get at least one step away from them, two steps away from them, maybe even get an introduction that you need. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this. What is the one technique that you think you use best to manage the flood of information that's coming in? Because, I mean, let's be honest. Facebook, I mean, if I had to turn my notifications off because my phone was dying from it <laughs> just, just constantly, you know, and I'm like, I wake up and I look and I'm going, okay, I got so many friends requests and so many private messages and then there's an email, good Lord, it's just piling up all over the place. So what do you guys use to, to manage and control it that, you know, maybe I'm not using or other people that are just getting started can implement good systems to begin with? I bet Jake has the perfect answer for this one. I do. <laughs> uh, 
I use a, a program called Wonderlist, and I pretty much just prioritize my time to um, each thing, like you said, uh, checking all my emails, checking all my notifications, checking each and everything going down the line, and just spending <laughs> an hour or doing whatever and focusing on that one specific topic instead of getting flooded with, like you said, your phone going off nonstop. Mm -hmm. I use Wonderlist as well, and that was one that was recommended to me by Jake. Um, and it's literally as simple as it's a to-do list app for, I believe it actually is on just about every platform you can think of. It's not an Apple-specific one by any means. And I do the same thing as Jake did. I pretty much stole his methodology there, um, which is I set, I have two I have two sets of tasks, and I call those zero outs or zero hours. And basically one is specific to my email, and one is specific to social media. And during those, usually it's about an hour, hour and a half with social media, depending on kind of how busy your things are, because I plan out on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis with it, uh, is to try and kind of shut down the you know, the the other stuff you have going on, because, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business per or whatever, or 9 to 5, or it doesn't matter. You have a lot going on in your life, and, you know, mm -hmm. adding that focus and utilizing, say, something that kind of gives you, here's this, you know, hour that I'm going to focus on, you know, zeroing things out, um, that's, that's really helpful, and that's a good way to go at it. And, you know, kind of like we were talking about earlier with friend requests, you know, like, Someone may have 300 friend requests, and they're they're not going to go through possibly all 300, but they may spend an hour going through 25 people saying, you know, is this the right person for me to add? Um, and you know, it's the same thing for me. Is I know, and I'm sure I'm sure you guys can attest to this, is that you can only do so much in a specific amount of time before it's either eating away into something else. So you know, be willing to section it off. There's nothing wrong with not commenting back on say someone's Facebook status that you were tagged in um, a day later. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, obviously, at some point, content or whatever it was gets stale, but there's no reason for you not to respond just because it's not five minutes ago or a minute ago when you were tagged in it. That's a huge problem that I've been fighting myself is I live on Facebook base, or all the social networks, basically, and I'm always constantly, but now it's kind of slow it, like Mike said, slow it down. You know, go out there and interact and then give it time and be willing to kind of let things, let the timeline flow and then, then go do your interactions over, over a period of time. Yeah, I like that. And I think another big point to add on to that is I think you could, a lot of people need to, at least I, I've struggled with this a lot, I think a lot of people need to realize that being on your social networks and doing what we do on our social networks is actually considered like work time, you know? It, it's actually Absolutely. considered like like the hustle and, and getting out there and doing things. Um, and it's not just considered just, oh, you're sitting on Facebook all day, what are you doing, <laughs> you, you know? Um, that that kind of that connotation that that has, um, but yeah, just just being able to realize that sitting on Facebook for an hour and and having a, a conversation, commenting on people's uh, content that they're creating shows that you care, and it shows that you care about what they're working on. And and once you care about what they're working on, they're gonna hopefully uh, reciprocate that and care about what you're working on. So I think it's just a a constant thing that you have to manage, and obviously don't constantly just live on Facebook alone and, and all these social medias and, and live in your, your room, but <laughs> uh, be, be able to, to manage it and, and like everything in life, find a balance. Absolutely. So do you guys ever just completely disconnect? I mean, with I know with mobile phones and iPads and tablets <laughs> and everything else, the, the, the challenge is um, you want to stay connected all the time. And do you guys just pick a time during the week where you go, you know what, Friday afternoon from 2 to 4, no Facebook, no Twitter, I'm turning my smartphone off, I'm turning my tablet off, uh, or maybe you designate times when you're working on something that all of that just gets completely turned off, it didn't, unless the building's burning down, you don't respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I probably should do that more, <laughs> to be 100% honest with you. Um, I take time throughout my day, a lot of the time, to just kind of take a minute, meditate, close my eyes, and just uh, just gather myself. And, and that's really when I just I go outside and I make sure my phone and my computer and all that technology are all inside. Um, and I just try to get away from it for at least uh, 20 to 30 minutes, you know, just, just to relax a little bit and, and let the mind... Uh, Un unwind a little bit, but um, no, I definitely think that's something I should probably work on more. Yeah, for me personally, I never fully unplug. I mean, I I love networking. I love connecting with people, so I don't feel I feel like it's it's a joy to me. It brings me it brings me a joy to connect with people each and every day and 
see who else. I feel like I'm missing out on something if I'm not connected, if I'm not responding. So I never fully unplug to answer your I question. Vouch, I can vouch for that. That's definitely the same for me, too. Like, as some of you know, I just came back from a three-week vacation from, like, eight different countries, and it was a real problem for me to disconnect. Like, there were times in India I went, like, five days without any solid internet connection, and that was really, like, stressful to me. Like, and, and it sounds terrible, too, but it's it's not really bad because, well, for me, I mean, like, health-wise, maybe somebody could argue that, <laughs> but but in terms of, like, like, what Michael was saying, like, it's not not bad to spend time on Facebook if you're using it in a productive manner. So, like, I ended up just, like, going over to, like, my dad's former professor's house and just, like, hanging out there because he had, like, good Wi-Fi. And so I would just connect for, like, a couple hours a day there, and that was that was really good. And honestly, the only time that I ever fully disconnect is when I sleep because right now is the summer, and obviously I'm always – and you guys see that too, those of you who are connected with me. Um, and I'm always online. And I love it because that's just what I like to do, you know. That's just – it's fun for me. And it's work too, which is the best part. But even like, you know, once school starts and things, there's some boring lectures. And I, come on, all you kids also who just graduated are guilty of that, you know. You're sitting in a, in a you know, a lecture or something and you're browsing off to something else because in the end what really turns out to be more important, you know. I mean, that might sound bad actually. But, you know, <laughs> there's some decisions you have to make. So – Networking is something I never really turn off because it's just you do feel like you're missing out, like Jake said. Like I, I told Michael this yesterday. I never miss or I try to never ever miss a single Facebook post because I really feel like I'm missing out because I feel like what if somebody posted something that was really thought provoking and would have made me think something that could lead to like a big thing. Mm -hmm. And if I if I miss that, I might miss it forever, you know? And that's what we were talking about earlier too. So even if I am disconnected for a while, I compensate by going back and, and making amends for that, you know? Absolutely. Exactly. And I, and I like, I really like what Jake said earlier, and is the fact that we love doing this, you know? It's not something where I'm like, oh, I have to go on Facebook and talk to people. It's something that I'm like, yeah, I'm excited to, you know? Like, let's make this happen. Let's meet some more people, you know? I wake up in the morning excited about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good point that Jake made because, like, Maybe you might be more, uh, you might be just kind of self-conscious or you might be a little worried about it, uh, sending random friend requests, but trust me, after you send one or two and they accept it and, and you get to meet these people and just chat with them, you're going to be ecstatic about waking up in the morning and getting to meet some more people. And, and that's the way that I look at it. I look, like, I look at it like I'm meeting people, not that I'm getting my friend request accepted or, or whatever social media term you want to use. Yeah, Absolutely. I'll be honest, I um, I work a crazy amount, call it because I'm an entrepreneur of sorts or whatever it is, but um, so about three weeks ago, I did a cutoff period because just like Karan said, I I have a little bit of a problem where I live on social media. As much as I enjoy it and it's work, I definitely spend far more hours than I should. And from one of the groups I'm in, Facebook groups, as you mentioned earlier, Scott, um, all these guys would constantly tell me, I, I got the same thing, that you need to focus. So kind of a lot of the stuff we've been talking about with the wonder list and the focus time, as well as being so busy at my main nine to five mm -hmm. job, being a programmer, uh, and that little week that I had, I actually, you know, I started to kind of, I, I started to back off and, and be more cognizant of how much time I was spending when I would put more focus into different things. Um, but the kind of a fun thing is, is um, I always, you know, kind of like when with uh, building a positive attitude, I try to like fight like that 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 side of it. So I do that with social media now, which is that. When I want to go on the media or I want to go answer a bunch of stuff, I ask myself, like, say I'm at the gym and I want to leave in a hurry to go, is um, am I losing money? Am I run I'm not running a Fortune 50 company? I'm not, you know, the world's not going to burn, and because I didn't go on Facebook right now, you know. And when I when I answer when I ask that to myself, I literally ask myself that. I'm kind of like, well, why am I in such a hurry to leave? I have no reason to jump back home to be on the computer for another six hours doing all this. So. It's almost, like I said, it's kind of building that momentum to understand. Like I said, the world's not going to end just because we didn't do it, but I'm also not ruining my business or my brands by not constantly living on it, you know? Yeah, I think that's a great point. That You know, it's part of it's balance. you got to learn how to maximize what you're doing. Are you guys familiar with Parkinson's Law? Not Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's yeah, Law. I'm not. It, it, no, it, I'm not familiar. All right, it's a concept that basically... Um, 
teaches you that whatever task you have at hand will expand to fill the amount of time you give them. So if you have five things that you have to do and you set yourself a five o'clock deadline, chances are you're going to get them done at five o'clock. You know, you guys oh, are young yeah. enough that you you remember cramming for uh, college finals, right? Or <laughs> cramming for a project getting done. What happens as that deadline gets closer? All of a sudden, your work output jumps. <laughs> And that's Parkinson's law. I mean, it teaches you it's something that they've proven psychologically and even physiologically that we're driven by deadlines. We're driven by putting those time frames out there and saying this has to be done in this amount of time because if you don't put deadlines on them, your app will never get done. Your project will never get finished. Your program will never get done. It's something that, you know, as you get older, you start to realize just how real that is. And it's not one or two people running into it. It's universal, so it's something you guys should be aware of. As you get on Facebook, it's easy to be a time suck. You know, it's easy to get in there and say, "Well, I am working because I'm building relationships," but not always, right? Some of those times we're on Facebook or Twitter or other things, we're just killing time, and that's okay. It's just hard to differentiate when is it work, when is it killing time, and how do I get the most effective use out of. Um, you know my time on there because if I get on Facebook at three in the morning, the people I talk to at three in the morning are very different than the ones I talk to at noon or two in the afternoon, uh, and the conversations are usually very different as well. So you know you have to realize that work's probably going to be in this time frame, and just kind of cutting up and relaxing is in this time frame, and and scheduling that and managing. And by the way, I love Wonderless too. I don't use it. I use another program similar to it. But scheduling and managing those things, I think, is something that all of us can get better at because. We only got 24 hours in a day, and we do have to sleep, and we have to eat. And I guess you could go on Facebook while you're eating, but then you get like chicken grease all over your keyboard. Like, hey, it's just a mess, right? So um, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> you know, you eat while you talk and everything else. And, you know, it's on your phone and it's on your tablet, and you go start looking. And it's like, where did all that come from? Oh yeah, that's last <laughs> night's dinner, right? Spaghetti sauce or whatever. Um, so, you know, any of you guys that are not members of our Facebook group, uh, I will post a link to the event, and uh, I think Michael just joined yesterday. Uh, we got about five, 600 people. It's really designed for helping people with social media marketing uh, primarily. Uh, if any of you guys do webinars, I've also got a group uh, that I and that uh, guy JP Maroney started with about 1,300 marketers who just use webinars to sell their products and teach and train people. Uh, so it's very easy to use social networks to really leverage your ability to talk to other people and make those connections that, you know, uh, Karen, you said you've sent, what is it, 10, 12, 15, 20 friend requests and you're just going to keep sending them until they do it. Exactly. Find out what groups they're in. Find out where they're interacting and go mm -hmm. interact with them there because you can interact with them even if you're not friends. And once they start going, oh, yeah, I mean, I met a guy at a convention a, a couple of months ago and when I introduced myself, he went, I know you, you post in this group a lot. Exactly. Like, Okay, great. I wasn't sure. And just getting your name out there, like, there's names that you probably recognize sometimes before you friend them or they friend you, you know? And you'll, mm -hmm. and then, like, once they do friend you or once you finally, like, make the, the decision to friend them, or if they friend you, then you'll be like, oh, yeah, I, I've seen that guy posting all over the place, you know? And that's really cool to see how, how small our circles are because I know, like, a lot of us share exactly the same friends, and I see that when I see we have 98 mutual friends, you know, but <laughs> cool to see that happen. <sighs> so um, how much do you use that to, to expand your circles, you know, because, uh, you know, one of the problems you run into is that, uh, just like high school, right, you build cliques, and you only hang out with certain people, and you only get involved with people that have the same viewpoint on life and thought process. In a lot of ways it helps you to leverage it because you don't have to spend a lot of your time philosophically debating and everything else, but it also causes you to lose, um, I think, an opportunity to expand. Uh, I know that's one of the things, I've got some friends that are um, very, very conservative, I'll put it that way, you know, when it comes to voting and politics and everything else, and I've got some friends that are very, very liberal, and it's I generally tend to keep the two of them apart because most of them won't have a conversation with each other. They have an argument. But I think expanding beyond your current groups, you know, uh, you mentioned 98 common friends. I've got uh, four or five people that I've got close to 300 common friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's one of those things that you start looking and going, how do I go find somebody that I only have one common friend with that mm -hmm. may allow me to expand or learn or ask some questions? So what do you guys do to grow your social circles outside of, 
who you're currently with and your friends that you have and their connections and just go find other people that you want to be involved with? Um, that's a good question. Honestly, for me, I just reach out to people. I've found that just reaching out and, and sending a friend request, uh, usually is straight up it seems really simple, it seems really basic, but I think it, it's really effective. Um, and the reason I think it's really effective is because most of the people who I am reaching out to, actually all the people who I am reaching out to, are entrepreneurs. And all of us as entrepreneurs, whether we're in one industry or another, we're all going through similar struggles and similar challenges. And and especially like the mentality of, of being an entrepreneur, we're all constantly learning. And so we all feed off of each other. So I, I don't think it matters what industry they're in, what business they're working on. Um, I just reach out to them and I say, you know what, I'd love to get to know you, I'd love to see uh, the things that you're working on and really what you're passionate about and, and maybe I can, I can help you make your passion more of a reality. I would say too, um, you know, even before I had met Michael or Jacob or Kron now, um, you know, I had already started doing a lot of social media marketing, which is probably how Jake and I had originally connected in the first place. Um, so, you know, I've kind of, I'm, I've, again, Focus is one of my most horrible problems because as you know, an entrepreneur, we're always all over the place, which means that I have my finger in a lot of different fields. Um, and that's actually one way that, you know, even though I'm, you know you may be focused and working in one specific thing, whether it's your 9 to 5 job, whatever you're doing there, or your businesses, or what other people are doing, um, you know, like for me, I have just a common interest in a lot of different things with a lot of people. And really, you know, if you kind of if you can't think about it, what's the difference? The only difference between the internet and real life is the medium at which you're opening these relationships up for. So like Mike said, you know, reaching out to people and looking for those common struggles or those commonalities, it, that's, that's where we find these people. You know, like I said, I may find that Jake had this, you know, someone I saw commented on his status and it's someone that has a sim is similar, but now I'm connected with him. Well, now I'm in, you know, interacting with his group. And just like any kind of networking, it's just circles that, you know, again, it's your job as a networker, whether it's social media or another type of networking, to, you know, look for those relationships and see how you can build out, you know, a stronger root of ne you know, network of roots. And that's really how you expand. Like I said, it's almost, it's always been a snowball effect, in my opinion, you know. It's when you start a little, it becomes eventually a little bit more, and then eventually you get to a point where it's a lot. And I'm sure anybody that has, you know, 20,000 Twitter followers and now they're 50,000 for them it was very very obvious or the more obvious that we can all see visually you know measurably measurable success that it is a, that snowball effect and all they did was facilitate growing it larger and larger you know as they as they could or the best that they could and if you graph that you'll see that it's truly an exponential function literally you know it'll just keep growing and it's really cool to see that too yep. One thing I can add is, like, when I connect with people, to go back to your question, was I, I look for certain character traits. Like, for example, I, I found Michael Jacobs on, on Twitter, and I was looking through his profile and what his description was, you know, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. all this. And then I saw that he lived close to me, and that's how I reached out to him, and that's why we have the friendship we have now. So I look for common, common traits that we have in common to, to build that bond. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. That's the that's the kind of my structure is like finding. They don't have to have like thirty mutual friends. I just look for common traits that we could share and we can get the conversation started. Because once mm -hmm. I get the conversation start started, it's game over. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. Jake closes. <laughs> Closing the deal. If I can chime in here a little bit on how I try to expand that is. I just friend new people, and usually I meet those people through other people. So like by doing things like this. And, and chatting with people like for the past three days now I like basically I've been friending and accepting a ton of requests for like months on end really over a year now and really networking in that way but I haven't like I hadn't made a real conscious decision to truly network and think of it as that I was just thinking of you know meeting new people but in the past like two months I've really started actually making an effort to, to really form relationships with these people so initially what I do when somebody friends me or when I friend them, immediately afterwards I'll send them a message and I'll just say, you know, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'm 17 years old and I, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm founder of Carbon Trips, whatever, you know. And then you just say, tell me a little bit what you're doing about and, and stuff like that. And then immediately they're like, wow, that was, that was fast, you know. And, and then just being polite and just, you know, getting to know people really helps in that way. And then you schedule a call with them or a conversation and you get talking and then you just – bounce ideas off each other and you end up saying, do you know anybody who knows anything about this? I mean, that's how my business started. I mean, that's how 
like n none of this would exist. Carbon fiber, like I wouldn't have anybody if I hadn't connected with Secret Entourage and hadn't been good friends with the founder of Secret Entourage and asked him, just reached out randomly on one day saying, do you know anybody who's into the carbon fiber business? And within, like I think I told Jake and Michael this, and within like 24 hours I had a call with this guy who we knew that was the CEO of a carbon fiber company. So I mean, it's just opens so many doors and there's no there's no barriers. It's like you just say please and just ask and you can get almost anything and it's really incredible to see that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You just have to be open to it and I think mm -hmm. that's that's the key is is like like Karan did, you know, he just reached out and he was open and and he was open to succeeding as well as he was open to failure by sending the friend requests, you know, and reaching out mm -hmm. to those people. Um, and that's that's what it's all about is just being open to the opportunity of meeting another person and and don't be judgmental that you're meeting them on online or you're meeting them on Facebook or wherever, you know, just just be open to it. We're all people. That's what I always go back to. Exactly. And I think it gets easier too. Like, you know, when I was just first starting, I was like, I don't know, it's kinda weird, you know? And then after that, you realize a couple people don't accept it, a couple people don't reply to your message even even though it's been seen, like I would never do that. I think it's kind of rude, but I mean, if I do, I go back. But I mean, it's fine, because like we said, people are people. But you just let go, you know, and then just keep moving. And then something else opens up, and then you have new opportunities, so. Yeah, definitely. Love it. So how much do you guys use um, email in your business now? And I mean, I ask this question <laughs> because uh, my son's 21, which is pretty close to a lot of your guys' age, and he uses email almost none at all. I mean, but he's also not on Facebook either. I mean, he's not on social media at all, and a lot of his friends aren't either. Do you see your generation and kind of causing a split? Uh, you know, you got those that are technologically savvy and, and engaged and involved in it that are um, going to be living, eating, breathing it, and then there's another group that just completely bypasses it and you know doesn't connect and on the the you know, ones and O's as the internet is and or just wants it in a personal place or do you see that or with your friends are they all online and it doesn't matter to you guys? Um, I think that email is quite effective still. Um, I still use email daily. I mean I think email is one of the biggest tools as well to be able to communicate with people and and still um, reach out. I don't think it's super super effective. I don't think it's the most effective tool any longer but I don't think like we can discount it at all. I don't think we should um, put it down because a lot of people are still using emails and will still use email for a really long time. I think that snail mail needs to die before email dies. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I I definitely I can't disagree at all with that one. Uh, I I use email. Um, I use it frequently. Uh, but if I said it was anywhere near the amount of in, of use that, in comparison to social media, it wouldn't even hold. A candlelight to it. Um, what's funny is, is I would say that you know, with with my my web design business, um, most of my clients um, end up. Or I'd say it's a happy balance between both. But it seems that the email has actually increased for me lately. Um, so I, I guess what my point is is that I wouldn't discount email yet. Um, but again, as Mike said, very very good point is it's not the most effective means of communication. And I think really what it comes down to is speed, which is sad to say considering that email is still very fast. It's just in consideration of, say, an instant message on Facebook or a message on Facebook in, in comparison, we're talking about you know instant versus, say, even a few seconds, which anybody can tell you that at this point with the way how, how fast things are moving – Though that actually makes a difference, and I think that's one of the reasons why email is slowed down in many senses is that, you know, social media takes out so many of these barriers that we normally have, um, like email had done to say the phone or how TV had done it to the radio. You know, there's there's a lot of these barriers that we're taking out of the equation, and that's why stuff like social media flourishes. And just in regards to you said your son, um, you know, I think that there's still a lot of a lot of people that still have that very. Uh, uh, that social media is a trend and it'll die out. And the funny thing is, is that they're right. But it's not that it's going to die out and social media isn't going to exist. It's just the same thing as everything else. It's going to adapt. It's going to change. It's going to be the next evolution of where it's going or whatever the next step is for that medium. I totally agree. And if I can interject for one second, I have to actually leave in one minute because I have some people coming over who are actually potential investors in something. But... Um, <laughs> 
Um, but one thing that I'd like to, to think what you guys think of this is email can give you a sort of credibility in my experience sometimes. When you have a domain, a domain email with, with, your, with your company's domain as the, you know, as the address, I think it can really give you an edge sometimes, you know, and it can impress people, especially if you're a really good signature and that, you know, that CEO status at the bottom and, and a good, you know, logo. And people are impressed by that and they'll take you a little more seriously. And I don't want to offend anybody here, but I use email mostly for when I'm dealing with older people. And, like, not old, old but, you know, like, people <laughs> who range from, like, people who range from, like, 40 to, like, Yeah, you're, you're getting ready to get booted. I just want to <laughs> say. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, one of my mentors is totally, like, he's on Facebook, but he's a very private guy. And he's, he's very, he's a billionaire, actually. And he was, he was CEO of Pirelli and Ometric and a bunch of other companies that he actually helped found. But the only way, essentially, that I like get in touch with him is through email and phone, and that's fine. It's his decision, and it's just I kind of resort to it as when it's necessary, like when it's the only option. But at the same time, I also use it when I want to make a new connection and I need to be taken very seriously, very quickly. And that's just I, I like to hear what you guys have. If an I like that. Like that. I like that. I think that this kind of just came to me. I think the separation between email and social media is I use social media more for networking and like looking to meet new people and reaching out to new people whereas email I more use as if I get an email if somebody wants to have me on their their podcast or something mm -hmm. like that they'll shoot it to me in, e in an email you know if mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach out to an editor or, or someone at a, at a tech crunch or a high-end magazine um, I'd use email for that. I wouldn't use Facebook. Right, um, right. So I think I think yeah. it just has a different purpose, a different tool um, to use. But I definitely think that you should be using both of them um, because people use both of them. You got to exactly. be where people are. To, mm -hmm. to just totally get rid of it would be so stupid. I mean, yeah. Individual. I mean, it would just be <laughs> a terrible right. decision. You know. I but, think um, there's, a, there's a professionalism to that to that side of the brand of email still, and I'm not mm -hmm. saying that other networks can't contain that same level, um, but you know, when I think like, especially like Facebook, very, I get, if I had to like brand, you know, how a social network is versus email, I don't, I would never, I would never feel as open and comfortable and as personable on email. Um, I, there's no difference between me sending a message in email versus a message on like a chat as far as like the level of communication. Um, but the connotation that I hold for each of those two different mediums is is that of where email is much more of, of the professional side and it's not as personable but again it could build into something like that so that's the way that I kind of view it at least exactly well uh, if I can cut in real quick I really have to go but I want to thank you all for taking the time to let me into this and it was really fun so later Karan definitely join next time too hey Karan glad to have you man all right likewise uh, all right stay all right, connected <laughs> um, you know one thing you guys had mentioned you know when you were talking about like CEOs um, you know, when you're young and you're growing and you're trying to expand, you're constantly pushing out. Once you get up to that, and the only reason I say that is because I got a, a friend of mine who's a CEO of a hundred million dollar company. He's not on Facebook. He's never going to be on Facebook. He's not on Twitter. He's not on any of these things <laughs> because in in his world, he's trying to control the flow to him because too much is coming at him versus what he needs to push out. You know, and yeah, I, I think that's something to realize that as we all go through our growth in our business and everything else that when you have a hundred million dollar company and people are trying to connect to you more than you're trying to connect to them being able to manage and control that flow is a very different thing than when you got a million dollar company and you're trying to grow it into a hundred million dollar company so you're constantly hey where do I make that next connection and you know I think that's just interesting um, you know you made the comment Dan about email being more professional uh, but you know it's kind of evolving too because you know Karen mentioned you get respected a little bit more if you've got a domain and things. But shoot, for fifteen bucks you can get a domain name and an email that <laughs> looks professional and it routes to your Gmail. You know, and yep. you're sending from your Gmail and people never know. And I, I think that does give you the perception. Uh, actually, one of the groups I'm in on LinkedIn, we've been having this discussion for a couple of weeks. Get is you know if you get an email from somebody at gmail.com or yahoo.com or hotmail.com do you treat it differently than you if you get it from uh, sociallinkapp.com you know mm -hmm. and it's and true. what do you guys think i mean do you do you treat somebody differently who uses a, a free one and you know 
even rank them. Gmail, I, Yahoo, Hotmail, AOL, God forbid, right? Um, <laughs> uh, if they have AOL, they aren't even going to get my email address. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, so coming from outside of like the social media side, like if someone from social media or in general, sorry, email that had a Gmail, I wouldn't dismiss it at all. Um, but like there's a certain point where I do, um, or I don't, sorry, I don't dismiss it or, or become judgmental of it, but it's more so as it helps me kind of identify where that person stands potentially, and again, that does not for sure, that is not a for sure. But again, it's judgment doesn't have to be negative or positive when when you meet someone or when you talk to someone. Um, you know, it doesn't have to have either connotation or it can go either way. Kind of like the word consequence. It doesn't necessarily mean negative or po or negative only. Whereas that's what most people think of it as, and it's kind of the same thing. So you know, like a good example is in my professional development land. Um, I. If someone works in, say, the field that I do, programming or website design or creative design, if they have a Gmail, I kind of have a lesser positive view of that of that person coming to contact me. And it's not that, again, it's not like I think they're a bad person or anything, but it's just that, you know, you work in a field, say, like technology, where I would assume that that's kind of the level that you work at. You know, and again, it's one of those things that's why I do in my professional development, try and teach people, like you said, $10 a month, or $10 for a domain name and an email address, even if it forwards to a Gmail, it, it makes a huge difference. So, you know, I, I would say again, I'm not I'm not against people ha being at that level, but I definitely say that it doesn't bring the same uh, the same thought pro the same thought to them as it would as someone who came at me with a sociallink.com or whatever it is that you're working with. I like that point, um, and I'm going to feed off of that a little bit. I think it's all about perspectives, to be honest with you. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, I w like don't care if you send me an email from AOL or whatever. I'm still going to like treat you the same. Um, but that's just like my thought process on it. Um, but like a like a good analogy would be like uh, if if you're meeting someone at a networking event um, and they're wearing a, a t-shirt and jeans and you meet someone else <laughs> and he's wearing a suit, uh, who are you going to be more uh, like accustomed to talk to? Obviously, the guy in the suit. Um, yep. And and that's exactly kind of what uh, we're discussing here with the email uh, portion of it is is that if you want to be looking pretty and looking good, you you put on the suit, you get the uh, at Michael Jacobs or at sociallinkapp.com, uh, you know, uh, domain name as well as email, and people will look at you differently. Um, maybe not everyone, like like myself, I personally don't care, but a large majority of people um, already kind of have that built into their perceptions, and you kind of need that that solidifying factor to to finalize everything and to prove yourself, you know. Yeah, that that's kind of that's sorry, that, I think that's a better way to clarify what I was getting at, and. Um, the um, suit the analogy, analogy, which actually that kind of leads me to um, as a piggyback back for it. So one of my best friends works in construction management, and obviously he's not of any technological as far as getting himself a domain name and a website. But you know, he as a as to help him out, um, you know, I built him a very basic website. I gave him an email address, and I you know I built him a custom you know very simple resume with a design to it. And again, it wasn't that you know if he went to say apply for jobs, which he's in the process of right now. Um, it's not that, say, like an interviewer is looking down on someone that has a Gmail, but it's something that, again, like you said, the suit, it's a, it's a thing that sets you apart. It allows you yep. to step above others and, and identify and brand yourself and show that you have you know, this, this other level to you that other people may not contain. And again, it's never, it's never a negative. It's just, again, it's a step up that, you have the, that everybody has the ability to go to. It's just some people either don't know or they don't know how. Don't know how is one of the big issues, which is totally understandable. Which is again why I love working in you know the development fields that I do. Um, but that's like I said, that's that's how I really view. Um, like Mike said, that suit versus T-shirt. Again, it's not a negative. It's just how the perception can be upgraded almost for you to look in a more positive manner. Exactly. exactly. I like that analogy. I'm going to use that more. <laughs> I'm going to steal your suit analogy. So. It's okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one of the things I do. If I meet somebody, I may give them my uh, domain name, email first. But if I meet them on Facebook or something and we're talking, we're instant messaging and things, I'll go, hey, let me give you my email. I'm going to go ahead and give you my personal email, which is my Gmail account. Now, yep. it doesn't matter that all my other domain emails all go into the same place. It's <laughs> just a way to go, let me give you my private personal email. Let me give you my personal one. You know, it's, I don't want to give you yeah. my business. I do the same exact thing, literally. <laughs> you know, and they both go to the same place. So it really doesn't matter. But you know, to people when you're developing that relationship, it does let them go. Oh, okay. So you want to be more than just business. You want to be friends as well. And I think you know, for me at least, when I'm looking at business partners, people I don't want to work with, 
I look for people that I get along with, that I want to be friends with, that, you know what, if this business folds and falls, we'll still hang out and still talk because they're fun to be with. Because if they're fun to be with then, they'll be fun to be with to work in most cases. Mm -hmm. So um, I do think it's interesting how people see it. Now, you know, you mentioned T-shirt versus suit. You guys know who Matt Basak is? I don't, know. Okay, uh, Matt Basak, he's been in the Internet marketing world for about 15 years. Uh, at one point, he was doing 10 to $15 million a year in the business that he was doing. Uh, I've seen him present at three or four different places, and his standard dress when he's going to present is shorts, T-shirt, and a baseball hat. <laughs> because when he gets up there and talks, you know, people, when they first meet him, go, he's got shorts and a T-shirt on. And then his mouth opens up, and they suddenly go, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, so a lot of it depends on your dress and where you are meeting people and what kind of impression you're going to put on. Uh, I hate wearing a suit. You know, it's not who I am, and I don't want to pretend it is. Uh, but if I'm going to a business meeting, I may go put on, you know, slacks. I would prefer blue jeans and a pullover. You know, that's me, and I'd rather you know that up front. And I think, you know, social media allows us to just kind of do that, be ourselves when we're interacting and everything else. Um, look, guys, I know we've been on here for about an hour and a half. I have really enjoyed it. Uh, seems like everybody else is dropping off. And I'm on the East Coast, so it's getting dinner time for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we understand. Then, then where are you at? You're on the West Coast, too? I am actually out of Chicago, which is why it's been nice to make relationships with all these guys because it's – it's not they don't not exist in Chicago, but I found that it's a little bit it's been tougher to build these networks like these guys here. So like I said, it's nice to that's actually one way I've actually expanded is getting out of Chicago. You know, most people would think Chicago is a pretty big city that you'd be able to find whatever you were looking for just there. But I think that's the power of social media. You know, it allows you to connect to people that are across the country. Um, I've got a couple of groups I'm in where you know we're worldwide. It doesn't matter what time I'm up, I'm gonna find somebody intelligent to talk to about business problems at 3 in the morning, at 6 in the morning. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not exactly. at 6 very often, but, you know, uh, and I think that's <laughs> the power of it, that it allows you to expand who you can run into and the people that mm -hmm. you can see. Um, Absolutely. Like I said, guys, I really do appreciate you guys being on here. I've truly enjoyed it. If you're not friends with me on Facebook, I am the only Scott Loving Good on Facebook, so I'm easy to find. <laughs> you just go into open search, Scott Loving Good. I know uh, Michael created his app because it was hard to find him, it's easy to find me. So, uh, <laughs> and I accept just about everybody's friendship request as long as you have a picture. You know, if you don't have a picture, if you hadn't bothered to even create that in your profile, I don't bother <laughs> accepting it. So, uh, Agreed. <laughs> shoot me a friend request. I would love to do this again another time. Uh, you know, if you Absolutely. guys have another topic uh, that you'd like to talk about. The Count group that in. we're in, uh, we're trying to do this at least once a week, get people on to talk about different things about social media, uh, whether it's Google ads or Facebook ads, and different mm -hmm platforms as well because I think the more we learn and grow because uh, it was interesting this started in a Facebook group but it ended up being executed on a Google platform so uh, <laughs> you know we are cross technology and I think that's the only way that we truly grow is to use all the tools that are out there so uh, Michael Dan I appreciate you guys hanging around to the very end uh, we've had quite a few people watching it and I know a lot of people will get the thing so uh, if somebody's looking to get in touch with you what's the easiest way to do that Michael we'll go with you first and we'll end on Dan yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, honestly, like we've been talking about, social media is probably <laughs> the best way. Uh, I'm, I'm at Mr. Jacobs 21 on all social medias, um, even Facebook.com back, backslash Mr. Jacobs 21, and that's Mr. Jacobs 21. Um, or if you want to just shoot me an email, I'm always on email as well. You can shoot me an email at Michael Austin Jacobs at gmail.com. See, there's that unprofessional email you're handing out. There, <laughs> <don't I> <laughs> uh, unfortunately for me, I was not blessed with as simple of a last name as Mr. Michael's. Uh, Michael. Um, so, uh, best way to find me, I would say, utilize the uh, name bar here across the bottom. You can use it on any network, but if you can remember it, uh, find me on Twitter at D D I G A N G I. And honestly, if you have any of these guys, you can find me just about anywhere. I'd be glad to kind of connect with anyone. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And and I tell you what, guys, if you want to make it easier, if you'll just shoot me those links in either a Facebook private message or Gmail or any way you want to, uh, I'll put them on the bottom of this YouTube video so when people find it, uh, you know, and even include a little description. Say, hey, if you want to connect and talk about this, make it easier for people to know, hey, you know, Michael's into this and Dan's into this. And that way, when people are connecting with you, they know like-minded, like, -minded, like um, 
resources, and you don't get a lot of you know odd women hitting on you. But um, you know <laughs> that probably won't stop that either. But you know, just uh, let you guys know. So I have truly appreciated this and enjoyed it, guys. It has been a lot of fun for me um, to talk to young people that are, uh, and I shouldn't say young people, business people that are interested in growing because they come in all ages. You know, they're 18 year olds all the way up to 80 year olds, and they still have the same mindset goals and, and attitudes toward life so for me it's been a great pleasure um, you know come like my fan page my Facebook page with uh, well squad which is what I've got up there because I've got 116 people and it feels lonely you know more people should <laughs> like it and it's just sad it's just by itself so um, like I said send me your information I'll be happy to put it up on the thing uh, on the YouTube video on the uh, comments so people can uh, contact you and get a hold of you so greatly appreciate it you guys have a fantastic and wonderful night alright guys and I look forward to talking to you some more you too. Thank you very much. All right, man.